Hey, it's uh, me, D.L. Uh, um I'm just being released from St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville. I want to thank them for taking such good care of me. I want to thank you all for your well wishes and your prayers. And you comedians who called said such evil things when I was scared to death, thank you too. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your prayers and well wishes. Um, when I came, I was being treated uh, for extreme exhaustion and... Uh, uh, dehydration, which I, I was very dehydrated, but it turns out they ran a battery of tests, and I also tested positive for COVID-19, which blew me away. Also tested positive for COVID-19, which they ran a battery of tests, and I also tested positive for COVID-19, which blew me away. Um, I was what they call asymptomatic. I didn't have. Uh, any symptoms that, you know, other classic symptoms I didn't have, flu-like symptoms I didn't have, uh, shortness of breath, I didn't have difficulty breathing, I didn't have um, uh, a cough, I didn't have a low-grade fever, I still don't have a fever, I didn't have a loss of smell or taste. Apparently, I just lost consciousness. So, in addition uh, to all the other stuff you have to look out for, if your ass pass out in the middle of a show on stage, you probably need to get tested. So I am uh, going uh, back to my hotel room to quarantine for 14 days. And uh, well, thank you for uh, your prayers and your well wishes. And uh, a few more of them wouldn't hurt. So hopefully... Um, I won't develop symptoms. Maybe this is as bad as it gets, and I'll just pass out over and over, or not. But thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, your thoughts and your prayers, and uh, they did not go unnoticed or un unfelt. Thank you. Thank
All right, everybody. What's going on? This is Super Mike. We're here. We're just going to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on. I noticed on Twitter we have this situation here where we have this woman here. Her name is Cal Calethia Hodges. She recruits African Americans for human trials. Human trials and what? And this is the same thing. This is the lesson that the white supremacists learned way back on us in Tuskegee. Remember, the experiment is to learn things. It's not just about the virus itself and how the disease progresses. They pretty much already knew that. They were looking at how the black community responds. What is the best, best methods of of uh, gaining the trust of the community. So that way you can go ahead and uh, infect them. Well, that's what they were doing. So that was part of the experiment. And what I want to do is want to touch base with some of us. And I just want us to look at this flyer. Now, keep in mind, this is the same message that they're giving us today. They're telling us the coronavirus came out. It didn't kill as many people as it was supposed to. So they're going to mix up a new batch, let it loose again. And this one's going to be more dangerous. It's going to scare us worse because it's going to kill more people, right? Uh, they told you that black people were disproportionately affected by coronavirus, even though it seemed more like old people was disproportionately affected. And, you know, some black folks died. But, you know, everybody died. Mexican people died. Asian people died. White people died. But for some reason, they want to put it on black people, folks like we the worst. Okay. They said that you might not feel sick. You might not feel sick, but you got to come here so we can tell you if you got the coronavirus. But really... Would that virus matter since we got all these different viruses in us? You know, human beings have, you know, trillions of viruses hanging up around them. You know, all of them don't make us sick unless our immune system is compromised. And that's the same thing with the coronavirus. If they can scare you, then they can control you. And this is the old tried and true method. But they can't scare you when you know that they're evil and this is why they show pictures of stuff microscopic organism this is a syphilis picture and you know we see stuff like this but this is what happens when we end up trusting the enemy you know these are syphilis source so just keep in mind what Eunice Rivers did by inviting these white people and it wasn't just Eunice Rivers. It wasn't just her. But she gets most of the blame because they trusted her. They trusted her. You know, we trusted her. We trusted our own people. She was a nice woman. She was smart. She went to school. She was a nurse. And, she, you know, Eunice was a nurse. She's smart. She's a nice woman. And, you know, she found these nice white people. Go ahead, Ernest. Go ahead, get that shot. What's the white man's name? We don't even hardly know the, the we know the black people's name, but we don't know the white man's name. This is uh John C. Cutler. This white man is John C. Cutler. And he was one of the architects of the experiment. And it's kind of like Kismikia. You notice right now she's the Kismikia with the, the coronavirus thing. They put a black woman's face up there. And you got Dr. Fauci is supposedly the boss. Look how short he is. He probably has a complex. But, you know, Dr. Fauci, Tr Trump, and all these other officials surrounding her, she's supposed to be the head of it. But they want her to attract the black people. 
Then you have people like this, uh, this woman here. Kalitha Hodges. She's in Atlanta trying to make sure that the black folks line up for the test. Come get tested. Come on, get tested, Negress. We need y'all to be tested. Now, these pictures are available. This here, this, uh, forgot what this white man's name is. Oh, yeah, this is his name. I think his name is, uh, Thomas Paran. And he got mad because people started dragging his name through the mud as he started getting older. But the white people's names, if you notice, they don't really push them out. We don't really hear them a lot. Keep in mind, let's look at one more other issue. Anybody can pull this up. Here's the patent number for the coronavirus. This is the patent, November 20th, 2018, coronavirus. United States patent, the Peerbright Institute, November 20th, 2018. 10130701B2 patent number. That's the patent number. What is the coronavirus for? It says the present invention. The present, in, this is the patent document, US patent document. The present invention provides a live attenuated coronavirus comprising a variant replicase gene encoding polyproteins comprising a mutation in one or more of non-structured proteins. Okay, they name those proteins. The coronavirus may be used as a vaccine for treating and or preventing a disease such as infections, bronchitis, which is you know, inflammation of your airway in a subject. So now we just had the virus, we just had the coronavirus. Everybody on the planet now knows they wanted you to go get tested. Go get tested. <laughs> you must go get tested. We need the Negroes to get tested. Go get tested. This is what they want you to do. All right, so you go get tested. Uh, I don't understand why they have to stick some way down your nose if you're going to get tested like that. Why do they got to get the back of your neck with whatever little device they want to test you with? Who know about that? Why? Why is that important? Especially since we they tell us that the coronavirus can get you, you know, just by coughing so it shouldn't be that hard to get a sample it's just for me what i'm thinking but anyway this is what they want you to do go get tested and uh to me you know they got them in africa they're getting the africans there was hardly no cases in africa but they got the african people scared you know Go get tested. Now, keep in mind, they pay you a lot of money just for you to, uh, they pay your leadership a lot of money to scare you to get these tests. But, you know, let me read a couple things here. Now, now they're wondering here, why are black people so mistrusting of the medical profession? Why? You know, they, it's, they don't understand why, why we... <laughs> Why we don't trust them? And let's see what uh, Fannie Lou Hamer said. Everything that will comprise, yeah. So everything that will compromise in five minutes, excuse me, excuse me, everybody that will compromise in five minutes was the people with a real good education. I don't understand that. This is Fannie Lou Hamer from Mississippi. That education, I don't understand that. I really don't to save my life. Them folks will sell you. They will sell your mama, they mama, 
anybody else for a dollar. What kind of folks was she talking about? It's these educated folks. You know? Now, if you look at uh, elderly people, they usually have a good look on their face, but she looked like she knows she did something wrong. She was getting them folks trust, getting them messed up with that uh, syphilis. You know, and I show you these pictures because the way this syphilis works is these these spira cheats. They swim around and they start, you know, they eat off of you that way. But uh, let's go ahead and read something here. Let's go to reading. She wasn't the only one. Let's look at the other black doctor. Dribble. Eugene Herrick Drib Dibble. Eugene Dibble. These were the two black people that they used to uh, get to get into the community of Tuskegee. So Eugene Dibble Jr., he was a medical director of the John Andrew Memorial Hospital and Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. He was awarded the 17th Distinguished Service Medal of the National Medical Association association by unanimous vote mm, everybody was giving him biscuits and money and degrees and delegates the house of delegates of the association at its 67th annual convention in chicago illinois august 13 16 1962 the award was made in recognition of dr dibble's career long selfless dedication to the improvement of health care for the people he has served and the imminent success he has achieved as an organizer, administrator, and promoter of activities for professional advancement. But right here, so that's Dr. Eugene Dibble. That's where he was given his little uh, distinguished medal in 1962. This was 1962 was 10 years prior to everybody understanding that uh, this Tuskegee experiment was a government, you know, funded murder situation. So actually Dr. Eugene Dibble, an African-American doctor that had it, you know, he's the one that recommended Eunice Rivers. He recommended Eunice Rivers. So he's actually the one who brought her in. And he brought her in because he knew that she had strong connections to the community. And she and him, the, the black doctors, introduced these white folks. These white folks, and they came in sticking on people. That's John C. Cutler. And he was in, uh, they, him, him and uh, Thomas Perrin, these two, they went to, because they got found out in Tuskegee, they also went to uh, South America. The, uh, shoot. Yeah, they went to South America and they began doing experiments on the Guatemalans. So this is, this is what, this is white supremacy this is what they do. They want to do experiments because when they want to kill people, they need to understand how to do that, you know, how to how to get it where the people accept it and really soak up the uh, the poison and won't be suspicious. And this is what they're looking at. This is what they're looking for. So let's get some. Let's see what you need. All right. So that's devil. I'm gonna play some from Dale Big Tree. Let's see if we can get this. So now, I'm not gonna. This is High Wire with Dale Big Tree. Sure, of the presidents of robber companies. There's an agenda, folks. All right, so now, 
it's the high wire with Delta Big Tree. He he uh, keeps up on a lot of good uh, vaccine issues. You know, we'll just kind of listen in on some of what he's got to say here. There's an agenda force to force vaccinate you. They are gunning for any product that could actually take away the need for a, a vaccination. Remember, the CDC has already told you the death rate of COVID-19 now appears to be 0.26%, a quarter of 1%. Why were anyone still locked down? God only knows. Why were men wearing masks? God only knows. But even more importantly, why are we still searching for a vaccine uniform? You know, I've talked about this before. We know that they want the vaccine uniform, but now it has what? Even greater potential? Are we developing Operation Warp B? Is this vaccine uniform now gaining the superpowers of warp speed? Well, it does appear that it is, and it's scaring the hell out of a lot of people, including vaccine scientists and proponents. Take a look at this little expose on CNN. It gives you a pretty good feel of where Sanjay Gupta and Dr. Peter Hotez are at. I have very recently uh, seen early data from a clinical trial with a coronavirus vaccine. And these data made me feel even more confident that we will be able to deliver a few hundred million doses of vaccine by the end of 2020. We will deliver by the end of this year, a vaccine at scale to treat the American people and our partners abroad. So we're working for a fully approved vaccine, but we'll also use the tools we have, for instance, emergency use authorization um, as, as appropriate. We use all of our regulatory tools to bring vaccine available for the entire American population by January. This doesn't fit with any timeline that we've ever heard before with regard to vaccines. Uh, you know, typically you're talking about many years, not many months with something like this. You clearly are hearing from some very impressive individuals who have a long history of vaccine development. Uh, Mansa Slowy, who you know, has uh, uh, been at a company that was responsible for making 10 vaccines. Um, the timeline on these vaccines, though, several years typically to, from, from actual development all the way through FDA approval. So the idea now that we're talking by the end of the year, a possibly fully approved vaccine, not just one that has an emergency use authorization that's uh, for healthcare workers, but a fully approved vaccine. That is the fastest timeline that we have heard period in this discussion. The problem is you know, it's to be able to test that the vaccine is both safe and effective. And as far as I understand, phase three clinical trials on the first vaccine, the Moderna one won't even begin till the end of the summer. I don't see a path by which any vaccine is licensed, uh, whether it's emergency use or otherwise, until the third quarter of 2021. Uh, so I understand that it could be manufactured uh, by the, several vaccines can be manufactured by the end of the year. I, I, I just don't see how you collect enough safety and efficacy data to say that we can have a vaccine for general use by, by the end of the year. Amen, Dr. Peter Hook. So, well, like I said, these people, they want to go ahead and uh, rush the vaccine. But if you notice, they have, uh, they have this patent. So this patent already exists from November 2018. So look, that's why people are calling this thing pandemic, right? Look at that. It's already an attenuated coronavirus. It's an invention. You can look this up yourself. All right. So these are just facts. I mean, facts are facts. You know, when people lie, here's a here's a good thing. People get mad because facts are facts. A liar will get mad at you because you know the truth. So let's uh, let's look at this. Now, keep in mind, they want to play this game here. They want to say that the coronavirus, a COVID-19 vaccine won't work if the trials will will work only if trials include black participants, experts say. 
They don't say which experts. So this comes out July, June 17th by Curtis Bunn. Kalithia Hodges, this lady, the new Eunice Rivers. So Kalithia Hodges, Kalithia Hodges has an arduous task, persuade black people who have a deep mistrust of experimental drugs in medical institutions to participate in clinical trials to help find a vaccine for the deadly coronavirus, right? So keep in mind, this virus haven't killed as many people as they wanted it to kill. And maybe it was just a test run and then they'll release the worst, the, 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 the worst one later. Keep in mind, 116 lives out of a country of 360 million people over a, what is this, a five-month period, five, six-month period, 116 lives. You know, these that is kind of what happens almost anyway, right, as far as people passing away. People pass away like that. Um, and you can look at the year, the numbers, from years back, you know, it doesn't go up that much just because of this particular coronavirus. So almost a quarter of those were black, according to a study called Color of Coronavirus. So they want to say a quarter of those were black, according to a study. Now we know as well that we have uh, nurses that whistleblow told us that a lot of these um, patients are being killed because they're not, you know, they were being killed because they weren't being, there was medical malpractice in their deaths. Let's look at what this dude says here. I just want to make a brief comment to get back to the discussion about the health disparities in, in uh, the African-American community, because it really is very important. And the reason I want to bring it up, because I couldn't help sitting there reflecting about sometimes when you're in the middle of a crisis, like we are now with the coronavirus, uh, it really does have ultimately shine a very bright light on some of the real weaknesses and foibles in our society. And as some of you know, I've the greater proportion of my professional career has been defined by HIV AIDS. And if you go back then, uh, during that period of time when there was extraordinary stigma, particularly against the gay community, and it was only when the world realized how the gay community responded to this outbreak with incredible courage and dignity and, and strength and activism, that I think that really changed some of the stigma against the gay community. So he's trying to put Very a stigma so. on black I community. see a similarity here because health disparities have always existed for the African-American community. No. But here again with the crisis, how it's shining a bright light on how it's unacceptable that is. Because yet again, when you have a situation like the coronavirus, they are suffering disproportionately, as Dr. Berg said correctly. It's not that they're getting infected more often is that when they do get infected their underlying medical conditions the diabetes so right there we, we need to understand this man said it's not that black americans are getting infected more they're trying to say that you're just so weak when you do get infected, been defined by nothing. hiv aids and if you go back then the hypertension have a virus they are suffering disproportionately, as Dr. Berg said correctly. It's not that they're getting infected more often, it's that when they do get infected, their underlying medical conditions, the diabetes, the hypertension, the obesity, the asthma, those are the kind of things that wind them up. All right, so those are the kind of things you need to listen to in a liar, because this man is trying to set us up for another cash cow. That's what they want this coronavirus to be, the new AIDS. 
They made a lot of money from that, from the medications, from the treatments, from the hospital visits. And this is what they want with the coronavirus. They're not interested in cures. They're interested in treatments. And that's what a vaccine is. A vaccine is not a cure. And we need to understand that and keep it moving. So let's look at some other stuff here. Now, this is the reason why nobody trusts them. Now, that was uh, this woman here. Uh, What's her name? This Califia. You know, she wants, she's trying to be the new Eunice Rivers. As we see with D.L. Hughley, he got sick because he was, he got sick and fell out on stage because he was dehydrated, smoking and everything, but it wasn't coronavirus, and they said that he had it. So what does it matter if you have a coronavirus, but it's not hurting you? What's the point? It's, it's, your problem is getting sick from it. So let's look at this here. Yeah. All right, so Kalithia Hodges, she's she's having a problem. She's complaining because black people won't listen to her. You know, they don't want to take shots. They don't want to get the the testing. They don't want to do it. <laughs> they don't want to get the testing. They don't want to get that testing. And so she's saying, you know, that's why she does what she does. Said Hodges, a clinician, a clinician at infinite trials outside of at Atlanta. That's why I'm here. This is the neighborhood that's predominantly black African American. African American participation in the trial is critical. Medical experts have said it's critical. What's so critical? I thought we were all human. All you need is human trials, right? Use those white people. African American participation in the trial is critical, medical experts have said. Researchers of pharmacogenics, the science that studies how genetic factors affect reaction to drugs, stress that medicine could produce different effect results based on race and genetic, social, and economic, environmental dynamics. Hmm. So they're saying a vaccine might not work in African Americans if African Americans do not participate in the clinical trials to create the drug. So let me, what if we don't need? It? And so the power persuasion ranks high on Hodge's job. So she's just trying to persuade you because what? They send a black person in to convince you to trust the white man. I think we've seen this playbook before. She has to overcome the Tuskegee uh, study, and they call it a study, the Tuskegee experiment, when they purposely infected black people with syphilis, let them carry it around and give it to their, their families, their women. And then they came, looked right in their face, smiled right in their faces and told them, you're not sick. Keep, keep taking the medicine, keep taking the syphilis. And then they were dying. So this is what, this is what Califia want us to forget about. She's got to convince you out of that. Uh, so they wasn't given the drug. 399 black men died of syphilis. 100 died of related complications. See? Of the tw the drug. And 28 of the original 399 black men died of syphilis. 100 died of related complications. <laughs> that means they died of syphilis. 
40 of their wives were infected and 19 of their children were born with congenital syphilis. See, this is the kind of crap that they're affecting your whole family and your children. The reason I hear African-Americans will not participate are all heartbreaking and disappoint, disappointing, Hodges said. I have heard about the Tuskegee experiment a lot. I have heard they will give me the virus and they will put a chip inside me. And they want you to laugh at that, but is it true or is it false? Uh, they will put a chip inside me. Many say their parents raised them to never participate in medical research. It's all tough to overcome. And it should be tough to overcome. That means black people are learning. Black people are aware of their history and that's what you use to make decisions. You use history. Dr. Larry Graham, a retired pulmonologist, understands the lack of trust, but insists that African-Americans have to get over it. <laughs> they tell us to get over slavery. They tell us to get over not having our reparations, get over being poor, get over being uh, experimented on, get over being put into mass incarceration, get over the crack epidemic, get over, you know, the the way they did the Moynihan experiment, uh, the Moynihan report, you know, just get over it, right? This is the kind of language they use with black people. I wouldn't if they use that with the Jewish people. Tell them to get over the Holocaust and stuff, huh? What about that? Dr. Larry Graham, a retired pulmonologist, understands the lack, he understands the lack of trust, but insists that African Americans have to give over it. These people are disgusting. Genetics related to racial differences make it essential that we be involved in broad-based and diverse clinical trials of medications and vaccines, he said. The expanding discipline of pharmaco pharmacogenetics has taught us that we may respond differently than other races to medicines and vaccines. We must be sure it works for black folks. This can only be determined by our inclusion in the research-based trials on such vaccines. <laughs> this is crazy. Why do we care about what they problems? We ain't get it. Now here comes some other, here comes some other Eunice Rivers. You notice they keep on putting up. Black folks, let's see what this dude is. Larry Graham. Let's try to get a picture of him. We're supposed to forget Henrietta Lacks. You know? Larry Graham, let's see the one, not the... <laughs> Essential that black people get over it. No. I'm looking for the pulmologist, Larry Graham, dude, not the. Anyway. I don't see it. Anyway. So let's go to another uh, article. Let's look at some more stuff here. All right, let's see here. Let's see what else here. I got another one. I don't want to go over. So let's see. Dr. Althea. Some more black folks. They want you to listen to. But Dr. Althea Maybank, Maybank, the American Medical Association's chief equity officer, chief equity officer, 
and group vice president. They got these big titles, like there's something to be listened to. Of its Center for Health Equity says she is concerned that there is not an urgency from institutions to include African Americans in the myriad vaccine studies underway. Do they they include us in every study that they can with a bucket of chicken? They don't want to give you high enough, and they're going to include you in an experiment. Best believe that. There's a fear with COVID-19 how intentional the hundreds of trials are about diversity. Oh, Lord. I'm not clear and would make the assumption that they are not intentional. If so, I haven't heard about it yet. But if the distrust pre-COVID-19 was strong, the chances are even less now that Black people will participate. I worry about exploitation and medicines being used on patients without their knowledge or consent. Hodges said coronavirus human trials at her location will not occur for another month or two. She has been successful in getting African Americans to participate in other trials, most recently for women who experience hot flashes through disturbing educational pamphlets. Information is power, she said. So they use pamphlets to get you to go ahead and um, get experiment on. Agree to be experimented on. And I don't know what you're supposed to get from it, but they use a pamphlet for you. All right. Uh, here's another one. They have another girl called Kismikia. Kismikia. She is the head of the... She's a scientist, so we should trust her, right? She's black. And <laughs> this is what they do. And I keep in mind, the uh, Tuskegee experiment went down to Guatemala. These same dudes, these same people, they went to Guatemala to experiment on the Guatemalan people. Uh, let's look at that. I mean, we need to understand this history because, I mean, if not, I mean, People who don't read or listen to history, they're gonna they the ones gonna get experimented on. So just letting y'all know. Y'all can keep on getting it. They're giving it to you. So they're saying that the the Guatemalan experiment was worse than Tuskegee. It used uh, instead of 399 people, they used 1,300 people. Uh Frederick Ramos was 22 when he left his home in San Augustine. Guatemala in 1948 to serve the country's mil military. He came back. He worked for 30 months in the Guatemalan Air Force. He spent long days on guard duty watching over planes at the base. So Ramos moved to the city, 400 people near his hometown. Uh, over the years, it got worse. He felt uh, extreme strain when he relieved himself. Over the years, it got worse. He consulted doctors who prescribed medicines that didn't work. They were just taking our money, he said, and they were paying for these experiments. Wow. He treated himself with tea made from the fruit of wapo trees known for its an anal gestic properties. Mostly, he learned to live with the pain. So his children grew up later on, so did their children. His son, Benjamin, for instance, also has intense pain. So this is going down into people's uh, family lines. So this stuff ain't just, you know, with you when you make this decision. This They're doing uh, experiments that affect your children it affects your 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 family line here, and then they got the Africans. Though the African CDC steps up coronavirus response by rolling out one million tests, you know, and they're gonna use the same gameplay on the Africans. And what do what do they say? You may not feel sick, but you just might have bad blood. Come bring all your family you may not feel sick but you may have bad blood come get tested so that you can protect your whole family 
All right, so they, they trick these people. They come in, they get tested with pamphlets. They use pamphlets to get you, scare you with a pamphlet. The African Centers of Disease Control Prevention, they got the COVID-19 kits. Uh, and they're going out, they're sticking stuff up people's noses, down their throats, you know, and... You know, this is what they're doing here. I don't, you know, and keep in mind, this is how you do a lobotomy. They stick that up your nose. What if somebody makes a mistake? I'm going to read this piece from uh, Dr. Wesley's book. Let's look at it. Dr. Wesley's book. This is uh, Understanding the Assault on Black Man and Black Manhood, Black Masculinity. In this part, he's talking about murder, creating black zombies, creating black zombies. Can I get it? So we should get this book. It's a good book. In in Philadelphia, a black man dies of an overdose of heroin, and a reporter notices that peculiar scars on his head. A portion of his brain has been burned out in an experimental attempt to cure addiction. The neurosurgeon is located by the reporter and admits that his monkey experiments were inconclusive before trying his operation on human addicts. His monkey experiments were inconclusive. So then what he did is he got, you know, And that was in 1975, the second wave, Roger, Peter Roger Brigham. So this is Peter Brigham. So Frederick Goodwin. Oh, wait a minute. I got a picture. That's not Frederick Goodwin, but that's the one who made up crack. This guy here, Donald Siegel, uh, Ronald Siegel, he, he, made of crack. So let's get back to it. We'll finish this in a second, we'll be done. All right, Frederick Goodwin, director of National Institute of Mental Health, made comparisons between inner city use and violent oversexed monkeys in the wild. In Los Angeles Times, October 14, 1993. In September of 1967, after the Watts and Detroit's rebellions, three Harvard professors published a letter in the Journal of the Medical Association entitled Role of Brain Disease in Riots and Urban Violence. Listen, <laughs> are we having some urban violence, right? some urban rebellions that's going on. And in 1967, they wrote this, this paper talking about the uh, role of brain disease. See, they wanna say that your brain is diseased. So the role of brain disease in riots and urban violence. Frank Irwin was a psychiatrist while Vernon Mark and William Sweet were neurosurgeons. Mark, the head of the Department of Neurosurgery at Boston's, Boston Hospital, and Sweet was the director of neurosurgery at the prestigious Massachusetts General. Psycho Soul. In their book, Violence in the Brain, Irvin and Mark suggest that brain stimulation or psychosurgery might quell the violent tendencies of blacks rioting in cities. Now, keep in mind, this is how they do their brain surgery. Oh, hold on a second. They do their brain surgery by sticking stuff up your nose. That's how they do the brain surgery. So keep in mind, after these riots, they, they need to get these black people in here. But they need to get you in. We got to include you in the, the test. You got to be tested. You got to be tested. We need you to be tested. Come on, black folks, get tested. 
come on. So listen. In night, so in their book, Violence and the Brain, Irvin and Mark suggest that brain stimulation or psychosurgery might quell the violent tendencies of blacks rioting in the cities. Psychosurgery is a form of cerebral destruction. Is any surgery to the brain which mutilates or destroys brain tissue in order to control emotion or behavior without treating any known disease. It's a pacifying operation that blunts emotions and subdues behavior. Opponents of the procedure, Dr. Brigham, known as the conscious of the mental health industry, notes its primary and overriding clinical effect is subsequent production of mental dysfunction. Psychosurgery techniques produce docility, make traceable, tractable, and tame individuals considered intractable and aggressive. In his 1960, 1973 article in Ebony Magazine entitled The New Threat to Blacks' Brain Surgery to Control Behavior, uh, B.J. Mason sounds the alarm. So basically he's saying that targets are supposed to be depressed women, hyperactive children, drug addicts, alcoholics, epileptics, neurotics, psychotics, convicts, <laughs> that's everybody. Targets are often black. It appears that all one has to do to qualify for such a operation is to rub society the wrong way. So let's look at this here. Let's, this is another thing. Well, let's look at that little picture. Black people are particularly appropriate patients, right? They are particularly appropriate patients. I don't know if y'all can really see that right. Good. This is what they do here. That's what we're dealing with. Keep in mind, this is in response to the riots, riots in 1967. All right. So black people are as particularly appropriate patients to this sabri, uh, sabri, sabrali, I guess that's head destructive procedure, sebrally, I can't pronounce it correct, uh, sebrally, uh, destructive procedure go back to the earliest champion of psychosurgery in America, the eminent and now notorious Dr. Walter Freeman, who in the 1940s and 1950s, same time during the Tuskegee experiment, performed or participated in 3,500 lobotomies, the earlier version of psychosurgery. In a lobotomy, the doctor severs neural connections between the brain's prefrontal area and the rest of the brain by damaging the brain tissue. Friedman was an advocate of the use by psychiatrists untrained in surgery of the house of horrors, like ice pick method of the procedure. Hammering an ice pick-like tool through the patient's victim's eye sockets. This is kind of this kind of stuff. And this is what y'all want to do. Look at this. Now you telling me that I mean I know y'all think it can't happen again. They ain't gonna do that. But as soon as you put yourself in this position here, they can do anything they want to you. They can do anything they want to you. This can go this way or it can go up. See, once you put yourself in that spot, you're done. It's up to them to be nice to you and not kill you. So, but what's the point of it? There's no, why take the risk? It's going to be very dangerous after these riots because these are the type of experiments that these people do 
right after these riots because they're looking for brain issues. They think you have a brain problem. So this ice pick method, the patient, they picked it, they put this needle through this patient's eye, eye sockets. In this 1950s book co-authored uh, with his junior partner, neurosurgeon, Dr. James Watts, Freeman identifies the ideal patient for his procedure as older, female, and black. He wants to do this on black women. He describes a particularly offensive case and especially aggressive negress. This is how they, and you know, Fannie Lou Hamer would have been something like that for them. I'm not getting, not getting everything set up right, but anyway. So the bottom line is he wanted to do experiments on, uh, he said this was an older, gigantic negress of gigantic proportions named or Orthea, who for years was confined to a strong room at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. She was 300 pounds of ferocious humanity, we were all told, and Freeman was determined to make her docile by lobotomizing her. It took five attendants to drag Orthea to the operating room. Once the procedure was complete, however, the fierce animals become tame, Freeman reported. Mm. On the day after the operation, we could playfully grab Orthea by the throat, twist her arm, tickle her in the ribs, and slap her behind mm. without eliciting anything more than a hoarse chuckle. Mm. That's what they want to turn you into. They want to be able to, what do they say they want to do? They want to grab you by the throat, twist her arm, tickle her in the ribs, and slap her behind without eliciting anything more than a horse chuckle. This is the type of stuff that, you know, happens with medical racism. And that's why Eunice, the spirit of Eunice Rivers is not a good spirit that we want to continue on. We want to look out for these spirits, these type of people. These people, they do things for money. You know, they, they look out for money more than they're looking out for, you know, the people. And we can't deal with that because, you know, it, it's too dangerous. We, we're not, you know, we're not going to be fooled by people like this no more. Thomas Paran, and satanic John Cutler you know, and dibble. So anyway, I think that's all I'm going to make for this one. I want y'all to press up, press up that thumbs up, thumbs up. And that should be it. Thank you.